and of children and families. But you think I was just a model? Oh no, I'm real. I am Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth I. And I'm here with you today to talk to you about my life because lots of you are not at school. In fact, pretty well, all of you are not at school. So I'm here to talk about my life, particularly aimed at children between the age of seven and 10. But you can all join in because I'm good Queen Bess of the golden years of England, where we faced many things and won a remarkable people. And if I have a reputation as an extraordinary queen, we did it together, you and I. And we'll do it again. So let me tell you about my life. My father was King Henry VIII. Now, who's going to be very clever and tell me how many wives my father had? Talk to you amongst yourselves. Three, two, one. He had six wives. That's a lot of wives, isn't it? But not all at once, thank goodness. Or oh, Christmas would be noisy, wouldn't it? So my father, King Henry VIII, was married to Catherine of Aragon of Spain for over 20 years. What he wanted above all other things was a son. You see, in those days, people didn't think that women were nearly as good as men. I oh, can't believe it, can you? That men were believed to be hot, dry, courageous, God's first choice, intellectual. That women were wet and cold and lacking strength of mind or strength of body and therefore imperfect men in some ways. They haven't met me yet. So my father desperately wanted a boy, but the boys that were born died. And so in the end, he divorced Catherine Barrigan and married my mother, who was his second wife. Her name was Anne Boleyn. I was born on the 7th of September in 1533 at Greenwich Palace, between three and four of the clock, with the first of the autumn leaves falling into the Thames. And in that crowded, hot room that had been shut away, from everybody, for ladies withdrew from public life for 30 days to have their babies. That's if they were on time. And as you can imagine, my father burst in, crying out, let me hold my son in my arms. He'd even drawn up notices, letters all over the world that we knew that said, announcing the birth of a prince. And they had to put S on the end, as in princess. And he was sad. But he was embarrassed, and the reason he was, was because he had broken away from Rome. He'd changed the society we knew. He'd changed absolutely everything, both in terms of politics and in terms of how we lived our lives and religion. So consequently, he had done a lot to marry my mother, so sure he was that God would send him a son, but a girl. And then something very sad happened, because before I was even three, on the 19th of May in 1536, my mother was executed. They chopped off her head. And I was told I was no longer the Princess Elizabeth. I was not in line to the throne. But neither was Mary, the only child born of Catherine of Aragon. It was the same for her. But she was much older than me. And then my father got married again. You'll get used to hearing this, won't you? He married someone called Jane Seymour. She was blonde and quiet and modest. My mother had a brilliance about her that would call down stars from the heaven. My mother was educated. Are you boys and girls educated at the same time? What do you see in my time? Not that many boys were educated. It was extremely unusual for girls to be educated. And if they were, they usually had tutors at home, teachers who came to the house. They weren't all the same teachers, some taught music and some taught dancing and some taught languages and how to write and all I can tell you is suddenly my father was married again and a son was born and his name was Edward close to me in age and he and I could share a schoolroom together my brother but very sadly within the first week of the baby being born Edward Jane Seymour died Everybody was very sad. My father wept. I have lost the wife who gave me a son for England. Oh, I better get married again. Now there's an artist that I want you to look up. His name is Hans Holbein the Younger. That's a funny name, isn't it? Hans Holbein the Younger. He was a brilliant artist. You would swear 
that he caught the breath out of the bodies of the people of this time. And he was sent all over Europe to do sketches and paintings, drawings of rich, powerful young women who might marry my father. People who shared the same views about politics and religion. Amongst them was Christina of Denmark. You can see her portrait. She's absolutely beautiful in a black cap and a black gown and a lovely face looking at you like an angel. She didn't want to marry my father because she didn't have two heads. You can't blame her, can you? So my father, out of the group of pictures, picked somebody else. I wonder if any of you are very clever and know her name. Her name was Anne of Cleves, which we think of as Northern Germany now. And when you look at her portrait, she's like this, and her face is full of sunshine. She looks like she's just about to laugh. She looks full of joy. So my father said, Madam, I will marry you. And she came on a big ship with blue skies white clouds but there was not a big chest full of gold which was usually the present the gift the dowry that came from the bride's side of the family because they were not well off at all but when she arrived my father went to see her to surprise her and burst in upon her but she didn't realize who it was and well, that's quite surprising i wonder if she hadn't really done her homework because henry the eighth was six foot two and that is the equivalent of a man in your time, being seven foot and golden haired. And although he was masked and disguised for a moment, revealed himself, she still didn't know him. Unfortunately, like some paintings can be, and some photographs can be, the picture was, I'm afraid, far, far too flattering. And when my father, King Henry VIII, saw her, he said, she's got a face like a horse. That's not nice, is it? That's really unkind. It isn't what looks like that really matters. It's what you're like inside. It matters what I look like because I'm a queen and people must be proud of me and know straight away who I am and be proud of me with other countries when they come visiting. Ambassadors, we cannot say the Queen of England is in rags. So she was very sad. And then you wonder why I didn't marry, for I never married. I will be master and mistress in my own kingdom. People of this nation, look what I was learning. The first wife cast out Catherine of Aragon. The second, my mother Anne Boleyn slaughtered. The third, maybe they could have looked after a little better. For adults, it could have been Ergot. She almost certainly had retained placenta. And then we come, of course, to this poor girl. Anna Cleves. Well, she never went away. She stayed in England when my father said, I'm not staying with her. And so consequently, after six months, it was agreed that they should part, although they'd lived apart straight away. And my father gave a lot of land because it didn't embarrass him, you see. She'd behaved herself. She was declared his sweet sister instead of wife. She'd given a lot of land in Melton Mowbray. She must have liked the pork pies. She was also given other land in the South. In fact, in many places, my father felt humiliated. I must have me a wife who will give me another son, for I only have an heir and no spare. That was a spare one. So he fell madly in love with somebody called Catherine Howard. Now the Howard children and all the Howards were relatives of the Boleyn, my mother's family. So they had charm. You see, people are not necessarily attractive because they're good looking. They can be attractive because they're kind and funny and good to be with. And you just like being with them. Sometimes beautiful people, you can be with them a while and think, yeah, well, you're beautiful, but I'm a bit fed up with this conversation. And so he married Catherine Howard. She was young. She was a foolish girl. There's no question about it. The thing that made me great other than being a king's daughter. But to survive, as you will hear, it was difficult. I was educated. I took my books and wore them as if it were armour. I read, I learned how to make fine letters with a pen known as a quill. I learned about languages. I love languages. I learned to play musical instruments. Yes, I was given the chance. But any of you can pick a book up and learn more. If it's the right book, it will make a difference to you. Now most particularly you can discover books. And go and lie in your bed in a pool of golden light and travel to new lands and see new things 
All of these things are possible in this quiet time we have. Make the most of it, as I did. So my father married a Catherine Howard, but she was somebody who didn't think she needed to be educated. Lots of girls of her type weren't, but she was also foolish. She thought it would be all right to have a boyfriend at the same time as being married to my father, King Henry VIII, that dangerous, frightening man. Do you think that wasn't a good idea? Talk amongst yourselves. Three, two, one. What do you think happened next? For those who don't know, chopped off her head and wept like a child, for he had loved her and loved her. She had to die. Last wife, sixth wife, Catherine Parr. Now, Catherine Parr was an educated, kind woman, and she was somebody who'd been married twice before. Both her husbands had died. It was much more common in those days to die young. And so she knew a thing or two about men who were a bit grumpy with sore legs. And so one fine day, she married my father. And she bought him something new, maybe because he was getting older, into his fifties. It was older then compared with now. And consequently, she brought us together as children. Edward and I were extremely close. We'd done our lessons together. Edward was very bright too, a solemn, determined little boy. But there are sadnesses in all of these tales, aren't there? About ambition, about choices that people make. And I witnessed all of this. And despite probably being the most educated woman in Europe, and certainly one of them, and I never stopped learning all of my life. I carried on reading, learning more, finding out about you. I do want to say most definitely that in the middle of all of these tragedies, there is the light of kindness, such as you're sharing each other now. I'm sure you're being good. My father suddenly one day died. Hardly anyone could believe he could. How could he die? Henry VIII, he strode over the whole of Europe and said, we will be independent. But die he did. There were times he loved me, times I hardly ever saw him. It's going to be sad, isn't it? Now let's talk about the lessons. And you must say, yes, me too. If they're the lessons that you do, that I did as well. Did you do, do you do languages, other languages? If you don't, say your first word, which is bonjour in French. I'm sure most of you know bonjour, well done. And now let's have something in Latin, which of course people don't speak these days, but the Romans spoke, it's a wonderful language. So say this for me and put it in your heart like a motto. In other words, there'll be things that you may decide to say that sum up your life. And this one is summa sequendo. Say it, summa sequendo. It means in pursuit, chasing, excellence. I want you to think that you will chase and get the best out of things. Chase after the excellence. You might not be very good at languages, but you can be good at being kind and good, particularly at the moment. Particularly if whoever's looking after you, mummy or daddy or both, or two mummies or two daddies, you're going to be good, aren't you? Help. Because it's quite tricky. You can't be good all the time. You can jolly well try. So it's languages, mathematics. Stargazing. Did you do stargazing? We did stargazing. We believed the heavens were like God's notice board. And he took the planets like diamonds and spun them across the sky for people to be able to read. People trained at top universities to read the stars. And we did handwriting. You did handwriting, but we learned in a particular way. And the name of our pens again was a, a quill made of a feather. But we didn't use quills and paper, which was very expensive in my time. Most of our paper was actually made in France, out of rags, believe it or not. You won't be able to make any. It's a special way of doing it. But I had to learn with a wax tablet and a little stick. A wax tablet, not like a tablet you take. A piece of wood, and on the wood was golden wax from the bees. And then we would get a sharp stick and learn how to form our letters. Once we got really good at it, then we would be able to go to paper. But it might take a year before we did that. And by the way, because it was wax, they passed a hot piece of metal over it, which made it smooth. So you had a nice, clean bit of wax the next day. 
So I learned about that. I learned about dancing. All sorts of lovely, lovely dances. You might be able to look some up. You might be able to look them up. And if you've got someone else with you in the house, mummy or a brother or sister or whoever, you might be able to learn to do a Tudor dance. Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be fun? And maybe friends from school could all look like I'm looking at you today into whatever this thing's called and learn to do it together. That would be fun too. So I played five musical instruments. I was particularly well known for playing something called a virginal which looks a bit like a little piano, but it doesn't sound like one because it's got little sharp things that pluck at the strings. So it's more like a harp than a piano. So the sound is light, like bells. I learned how to horse ride. I could certainly do archery. I loved to hunt when I was older. Chasing after deer. Oh, some of you will be cross with me over that. But that was our sport at the time. It was one of the things we did. But languages I was particularly good at, and I spoke at least six, some say seven languages, by the time I was 13. But I mean not just bonjour. I spoke and understood it. I had to work very hard at my lessons. I started six in the morning till six at night, and in the winter, seven in the morning till six at night from the age of four. I think you've got something to complain about. But it did get me ready for life. It did get me ready to be a queen. And when times were dangerous, and they would be dangerous for me, I could lean back on the wisdom of the things I had learned from others over the years, as you were learning from me. I want you to know that I'm thinking about you. We're going to do a test in a minute. But it's all right. No one's going to come look over your shoulder. It'll just be fun. And of course, you can play this back for the questions again. You can play it back for the answers. But to start with, See how clever you're being. And what I want you to do is to get a bit of paper, to write down the questions, and then see if you can do the answers. You don't have to do the answers straight away, so I'll give you a row of questions and see how you do. Have you got a bit of paper? If not, you play this back and write the questions down. So the first one is, what was the name of Elizabeth I's father? The second question is, how many wives did King Henry VIII have? The third question, now you get a tick for all of these, but you get 10 extra points if you know this one. Write down the names of all the wives of Henry VIII, starting with the first one, getting them in the right order until the end. Now I want you to put a little line upon the names, next to the names of the children born to whatever queen. So Catherine of Aragon, who came before me, had Mary. My mother was Anne Boleyn, and she had me. And then, of course, there was Jane Seymour, who died, wasn't she, within days, and that was Edward. Very clever, lay it out so you can look who came in the right order, and the children's names. And now I'd like you to write down the sort of lessons that I would do. You don't have to do a list if you don't want to. You might decide to write a little story about if you lived at my time, what lessons you would do if you were a rich, high-born boy alongside me or a rich and a high-born girl alongside me. Because tomorrow we're going to do something else. We're going to talk about how it was for other people. And then next week, all being well, I will talk to you more about when I ruled England as the Queen. I don't want to give you too much in one go. I want you to think about me. Think about how I look. Look at my clothes. Think about what you would have liked to have worn if you came from this time. I was a great Queen. I ruled England for nearly 45 years. My brother came to the throne before me and died a young boy. My sister Mary followed and she married Philip of Spain. And there was great sadness in the land. For many of our people were taken and our money was taken for Spanish wars. And people were burned at the stake for what they believed in. 
I looked at this death and the black skies, black with the burning of you, and said, I will not have windows in men's souls. People of many faiths could come to this nation and trade with me and be with us. But if you bring revolution, I won't tolerate it. My education had made me a more thoughtful, gentle person, as it will you. In these weeks of quietness that you have at home, you can explore the world through books. You can't go out, very little, perhaps a bit of exercise. But what I do want you to know is, it won't be forever. But I will live in English history for as forever as can be. Because you still know who I am. And you still think about me. And one of the reasons, and in fact the main reason, I was great and good Queen Bess and all these other things, is because of your ancestors. If you have come here from far shores, or your ancestors did, you are still my children. You are still beloved. And all of this that you have heard applies. Now, the last thing I'd like you to do, children, before we move on to the lesson which you'll see tomorrow, is I want you to look here. Now, this here is the Tudor Rose, isn't it? You can see the two roses of Lancaster and York, white and red. Now, on your school uniform, if you've got one, you might have a little sign that tells you what school you're from. Now, I want you to think about your names. Your second name, if your name's Smith or Williams or whatever it is, think about it. And I want you to do a coat of arms as a drawing of what you think would be a wonderful coat of arms for your family. I saw a boy about five weeks ago and he had done one and his name was Quartermain. Quarter for main, French for hand, man. And so he'd done four hands in different colours. That was clever, wasn't it? Might be a bit more difficult for you, but if it is Smith, you can always show a smithy, can't you? Smithy, twisting metal and making horseshoes. If your name's more exotic, then certainly you could make sure that your family crest is exotic too. But keep in your heart, make the most of your education, and don't forget, summa sequendo. Children of England, these times will pass. Make the most of them while you can.